More ominous news on climate change. The UN says the amount of greenhouse gases in the Earth's atmosphere hit an all-time high last year, continuing a phenomenon that's been blamed for rising sea levels and extreme weather events. What will it take to reverse this trend? This is Inside Story. Welcome to the program. I'm Jane Dutton. The evidence is all around us. Our weather's becoming more extreme. Glaciers are melting and sea levels are rising. And now there's even more proof that our climate is changing. Last year, the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere reached a record high. That's according to the UN's World Meteorological Organization, which says the volume of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere grew faster in 2012 than in the previous decade. It also warns that radiative forcing, that's the warming effect on our climate, increased by 32 percent between 1990 and last year. Scientists now say the trend is making it harder to keep global warming to within two degrees Celsius, a target set at the Copenhagen summit in 2009. Now, the head of the World Meteorological Organization, Michel Girard, explained why we should be concerned. So the news are not good news. The news are, if you look at the uh, major greenhouse gases, in particular uh, CO2, uh, methane and nitrous oxide, for all these uh, major greenhouse gases, the concentrations are reaching once again record levels. For CO2, we are uh, reaching about 141 uh, percent of pre-industrial concentration. In other words, uh, we have increased by uh, 41 percent compared to pre-industrial uh, time. So what are the heat trapping gases caught in the atmosphere causing the problem and the focus of this report? Well, the main culprits are carbon dioxide, methane and nitrous oxide. Nitrous oxide is often found in fertilizer used in everyday farming and methane mostly comes from cows. But it was carbon dioxide that accounted for 80 percent of the warming, mainly from the burning of fossil fuels changes in land use, particularly deforestation, also resulted in the emission of carbon dioxide. Let's bring in our three guests to discuss this report and the impacts of it. From Copenhagen, Bjorn Lomborg, director of the Copenhagen Consensus Center and author of The Skeptical Environmentalist. From London, Assad Rehman, head of the International Climate for Friends of the Earth. And from New York, Daniel Lashoff, Director of the Climate and Clean Air Program at the Natural Resources Defense Council. Gentlemen, welcome. Thank you very much for joining me. Daniel, you're also involved in developing legislation at the federal level to place limits on carbon emissions. So let me start off with you. This report doesn't sound good, does it? I mean, what do you make of these findings? No, this is bad news. We're loading up the atmosphere with uh, heat trapping pollution and as the WMO reports, uh, the total heat trapping effect is now 32 percent higher than it was uh, just in 1990 and it's, uh, it's growing at an accelerating rate. So that's the bad news. The good news is that the opportunity to head off the worst effects of climate change is still before us and we're actually making some uh, remarkable progress on several fronts. Uh, if you look at the cost of solar energy, for example, uh, the price has fallen by 80 percent in just the last five years. Wind power is the fastest growing uh, energy source in the United States. And uh, despite the failure of federal legislation in the United States in, in 2010 that I think everybody knows about, uh, what people are less aware of is that the goal that President Obama set out in Copenhagen is still within reach of the administration by using existing laws, particularly the Clean Air Act. And that's what we're focused on now because the largest source of, of carbon pollution uh, in the U.S. and uh, increasingly around the world is burning coal in uh, electric power plants. And the Clean Air Act gives uh, President Obama the tools he needs to dramatically reduce 
the pollution uh, from from that source. So uh, we see uh, both really bad news, but also uh, some some reason for hope that we can turn this around. Okay, Assad, what are your thoughts on this report? I mean, is it is it anything new? Is, does it surprise you? Well, unfortunately, it doesn't surprise us. This is one report in a long line of reports. Earlier this year, in September, we had the world's climate scientists issue the first chapter of their report, their uh, five-year assessment, telling us well, very starkly that we were heading towards uh, breaching the two-degree temperature level, that climate impacts were happening at a much greater and a more severe level, and that the time remaining, the window of opportunity to reduce the emissions uh, was narrowing. So we've heard it and report after report has come back every single year. The key question now is, is the political will there amongst our political leaders to take the kind of action that's required to change our energy systems from polluting industries towards a decarbonized low carbon energy system that can bring not only clean energy to all of us, but also bring ac access to energy for the 1.7 billion people who are currently without access to energy. So the solutions are there, the technology is there. What unfortunately we lack is the political will from our leaders. Bjorn, the skeptic that you are, do you think this report is a, is a load of rubbish, hot air if I can say that? It is a problem. Global warming is real. It is a problem. And it's also, as the SAD pointed out, something we knew already. I mean, in many ways, we have had these project projections for a very long time that we're going to keep increasing CO2 emissions. And for a very simple reason, because cheap fossil fuels is basically what's powered China and it's lifting 680 million people out of poverty and what most of the developing world wants. And of course, at the same time, it's also what keeps the West rich. And that's why I think the real problem is not, is there, is there an issue? Yes, there definitely is. But it's how are we going to tackle it? And there, Daniel, a little uh, perhaps left out the point that the main reason why the U.S. has cut its carbon emissions is not because solar or wind. That's a very small part of it. It's mainly because of fracking. It's because the U.S. has opened up the opportunity to get cheap gas instead of cheap coal. And gas is much, much cleaner. Now, it's not clean, but it's cleaner. And that's how we need to tackle this global warming issue. It's to find cheap energy sources that also pollute less. Do you agree with that, Daniel? I mean, fracking is certainly a controversial method anyway, isn't it? Uh, well, it is controversial. It has a lot of problems. Uh, it's uh, absolutely true that natural gas has played a role in reducing uh, U.S. Uh, dependence on uh, even dirtier coal-fired power plants, uh, but that can only take you so far, and we have to move beyond fossil fuels to a true clean energy economy. So uh, the, the good news, again, is that the price of those technologies uh, is coming down very rapidly, so that if you actually look at the all-in costs, when you account for uh, the environmental damages from burning coal or natural gas, uh, the all-in costs, uh, when you consider those and the, and the health benefits of switching to clean energy, is that clean energy is cheaper now. Uh, so yeah, cheap coal is, uh, had a, a, you know, has powered the Chinese economy. It's also killing two million people a year in China from air pollution. And uh, the government there understands that the, uh, the way in which they're powering their economy now is absolutely not sustainable, that it's leading to social unrest and, uh, and having a really big negative impact, not only on public health, but on their prospects for future growth. So China is investing in solar. It's investing in wind. Uh, and, uh, and, and the U.S. is moving forward. So I think we have a real opportunity uh, to grow prosperity, which I absolutely agree we need to do around the world, but to do it with clean energy that makes that prosperity sustainable. Okay, before we look at the, the positives of this, Asad, if we can go back to the negative impact or certainly the impacts that these rising levels are having in your line of work. I mean, what sort of impact does it have on farming practices, for example, food supplies? Well, we are part of an international federation, Friends of the Earth International, which has over 2 million members and works in uh, over 75 different countries. And our groups work at a local, national, 
an international level and all of our work shows you know that the impacts of climate change are happening we don't need scientific reports now to tell us in fact many of your viewers can tell you from di direct experience we can see that the food price is increasing the severity of our storms already now that the people in Philippines bracing themselves for yet another super typhoon we know that the impacts of climate change are happening that they're not only adversely affecting our food production our health they're affecting people's livelihoods and killing hundreds of thousands of people every single year. And that is likely to get much, much worse. Oh, we saw earlier this uh, week a leaked report from the IPCC about the impacts of climate change, which there is due to be published next year, which warns us of increased conflict, of water stresses, of dr droughts and of famine. So what we do need to do is now is take the very bold step of not look at uh, unconventional foot sources such as fracking or oil gas but to be able to leapfrog those dirty polluting industries and recognize that we cannot burn even 17 percent of our existing fossil fuel reserves if we want to stop catastrophic climate change that means all the finances need to be invested in clean renewable energy sources community energy systems that are owned by people and that are uh, controlled by people so that we can actually create a much more sustainable low carbon and more productive world for all of the world's citizens Bjorn, you were shaking your head there when Assad was talking about these super storms that we're seeing at the moment, or we're likely to see. I mean, do you believe that possibly this climate change is exaggerated? Well, it's definitely exaggerated, and we just heard a very good example of that here. I mean, let, let's just be honest. The accumulated cyclone energy, which is one of the main measures of how much there's uh, uh, energy in the hurricanes and cyclones around the world, is at its lowest level it's been since the 1970s. The U.S. hasn't had a single land uh, uh, landfalling storm uh, hurricane except for one, uh, and, you know, very unprecedented. Now, this doesn't mean that there's not a lot of problems in the long run from global warming, but exaggerating it actually works in the opposite direction. Partly it makes people turn off the message. And I also think it makes us make really, really bad decisions because there's this panic, this underlying panic that actually make us make bad decisions. Now, let's be honest and realize that right now, you're not going to make most of the world switch over to solar and wind. It's wonderful, as Daniel points out, that they've gotten cheaper, but they still need to become much, much cheaper. And and we need to fix the problem of storage before they can really fill a big part. Daniel, do you believe that fear can possibly lead to bad policies? Well, I don't know where this panic that Bjorn is talking about is. I, I don't think there's any examples of countries going too far in reducing their carbon pollution. Uh, the reality is that we're not doing enough. Um, I agree that we shouldn't exaggerate, but it's actually hard to exaggerate this problem. It's a, it's a dire problem that's having effects now around the world. Uh, uh, you know, uh, the incident of extreme weather certainly varies from uh, time to time, but, you know, just a year ago, uh, New York City was uh, shut down by Superstorm Sandy, and uh, it's pretty clear that climate change played a role in making that storm much worse than it would have been, in what part because the sea fires? levels are higher, so the storm excuse surge me, jumping in. Uh, came so, into Manhattan more. Oh, sorry, sorry, excuse yeah. me interjecting. What, what about the fires that we're seeing in Australia at the moment? We've also seen fires, obviously, in the U.S. Yeah, I mean, as we uh, add heat trapping pollution to the atmosphere, uh, when it's dry, uh, the soils dry out even more rapidly, making the conditions for fire that much worse. And we've seen uh, record fires in, in Australia, in uh, much of the Western uh, United States. Uh, so uh, that's, a, that's an effect. Uh, as uh, Assad said, the, the report about uh, the effects of climate change on agriculture coming out of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is very sobering because it had been thought that, you know, at least at the early stages, a degree of warming might be helpful for agriculture. Well, that might, might have been true if it was just a smooth uh, increase. But what we know now is that along with that, you have these super heat waves that can kill a crop in just a few days. So even though the average may go up a little bit, and if that was all that was happening, it might not be a problem, uh, we're now seeing that the effects of climate change on food supplies will be very negative uh, around the world. And, and that is a big problem. Uh, as, as he said, we're going to see 
Uh, there's increasing evidence that uh, changes in climate uh, lead to the potential for more conflicts. Um, so, I, you know, I agree we shouldn't exaggerate it, but uh, it's pretty hard to do. Now, despite the mounting evidence of the catastrophic effects of climate change, world leaders seem unable to deal with the crisis. One reason for that is the politicization of climate science itself, with some groups trying to undermine the consensus among experts about global warming and its effects. Another reason is the perceived lack of adequate and cost-effective alternatives to fossil fuels. Related to that is the unequal distribution of responsibilities. Some developing nations feel they are at an unfair disadvantage at a time when they're becoming more industrialized. And perhaps one of the biggest reasons, the implications to the global economic system. Asad, talk us through the impact global warming has on the global economy and what role the economy has in the fight against global change, uh, global warming. Well, uh one of the most conservative institutions globally, the World Bank, issued a report last year where we said, where it said that we were heading towards a five degree warming of the planet and that would be catastrophic and the end of the, uh, uh, we would affect up to about five billion people globally. So I don't think it's radicals or anybody else who are, who are flag waving in terms of, of, of fear. I think the reality is very stark and we've seen the global scientists come out very authoritatively and tell us what are the likely impacts. We also know that what the economic impacts now it's very hard to, co to actually calculate what the long-term economic impacts are going to be because they are just so huge. What we do know is that if we invest now, if we invest less than 2% of our global GDP, we can actually tackle climate change as well as provide millions of new jobs, grow cleanly, grow more sustainably and do the very things and actually have, deal with the social deprivation and, un, and inequality that exists globally at this moment. So I think the solutions are out there. We know very, very clearly that there are solutions in terms of transforming our energy systems. We can fund global feeding tariffs which can bring energy and decentralised energy to the billions of people around the world. We know that food production, we can have sustainable agricultural production which doesn't really on intensive food production, which doesn't rely on deforestation, on, and we can change our food systems so that they're more sustainable in the long term. We can deal and support with impacted people and be able to adapt to the impacts of climate change now because before it's too late. So all of these are very, very concrete, very simple demands that are out there that are well costed, well funded, and we have the technology to support them. But again, what we see is, is some people would like to continue to muddy the, the science and believe that this issue is either up for still for debate and that frankly it's not up for debate anymore and secondly when we when we talk about the lack of political will from our from our political leaders we have to actually understand why now we understand why that we know that the power of vested interest of the oil lobby is huge and is influencing our governments. We as taxpayers are handing out over one trillion dollars every single year to the oil industry to fund them. They don't require that support. What we do need to do is now keep that oil in the ground. We need to keep those fossil fuels in the ground and be able to invest that money into be able to grow, grow cleanly. Daniel, and really that is the key challenge. Okay. So the key challenge now is let it's, me bring in got Daniel, to build a movement it, it, of people. if you don't mind. OK, you say you've got to build a movement sure. of people, but it's sure it's, it's keeping business on side. Uh, Daniel, the COP, which is coming up, the environmental conference, is sponsored by Mittal, produces more CO2 than Venezuela, BMW, that obviously has its problems, uh, cars, driving, and a Polish power station, one of the most dirty in the world. Why do you think that's happening? That's a rather strange coupling, isn't it? Well, I think it is. Uh, you know, the, the fossil fuel industry uh, is obviously making huge profits from uh, the way we're producing our energy now, and they're going to fight to uh, try to retain their position. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think we are now seeing a growing global movement of citizens that are demanding uh, clean power, and, and that's what we need. Uh, and uh, the, the, the news on the technology side, with the costs coming down, uh, mean that that really is within reach. So. I see uh, the, the grip of the coal industry in the United States, for example, really uh, weakening. Uh, that, that fight's not over. It's going to be a tough 
battle over the next couple of years to get in place carbon pollution standards to finally end the unlimited dumping of carbon dioxide into our atmosphere from power plants. But I think we're going to get that done. Uh, and we're going to get it done because uh, President Obama is providing some leadership and, and the public is rallying to support that. So um, it, it's, uh, you know, uh, the fossil fuel industry will continue to try to muddy the water, sponsoring conferences, uh, uh, trying to confuse people about the science. But we're seeing the effects of climate change all around us now. Uh, it, it's, it's hard to continue uh, to, to deny the reality and, uh, and people are demanding change. Bjorn, do you agree with that? And what do you make of the choice of sponsors for, for COP? Well, I, I don't have any particular comments to the sponsors, but in reality, I think we've seen the main reason why nothing is happening play out really well in this program. First, we've heard lots and lots of accusations that are at best mildly inaccurate, uh, but we also hear the constant refrain that it's the fossil fuel industry that's the cost. That may have been true in the early 90s, but in reality, let's just remember, certainly in Europe and the US, the subsidies to renewables are actually bigger than the subsidies to fossil fuels. Now, there's bigger fossil fuel subsidies in, in places like uh, India and Iran, but those are political uh, and, and mainly a, a question of trying to keep uh, the population in, in under control. So the reality here really is, it's much more a question that we're focusing on the wrong solutions. These were the same people who were arguing we need to have a solution in Copenhagen, and it failed in Copenhagen. And it's going to fail again in Paris in 2015 for a very simple reason. It's not because of the fossil fuel companies, it's because we're asking people to pay a lot of money and subsidies for very, very few benefits. Look at Europe. We are bound to spend about $250 billion a year for our climate policies. The net effect in 100 years will be unmeasurable. It will be 1 20th of 1 degree centigrade. So are you so saying that the wrong reality, people are, playing, paying, are paying for the impact of abusing this system? Well, no, I'm, I'm simply pointing out we need to focus on solutions that will work. In the short term, that will have to be to switch from very dirty coal to less dirty gas. That we actually know works. That's the main reason why the U.S. has reduced about twice as much as the rest of the world has managed through the Kyoto Protocol and the rest of those treaties. And in the long run, we do need to switch over to green energy, absolutely. But we're not going to get there before they don't need subsidies or they need very, very small subsidies. You're never going to get most countries to switch most of their energy, and you're certainly not going to get most of the developing world. So As the reality here is we can sit and have these conversations, or we can start thinking about what are the smart ways in the short run, switch from coal to gas, and in the long run, invest a lot more in research and development so that we finally will get those cheap green energy sources. I said, what about nuclear fuel? Well, it, well it well, it's, it's ironic uh, Mr. Lomberg t talks about that when he's in from a country that ha actually is phasing out fossil fuels uh, in their energy sector and, has ha and that's happened because government support, but yes, but community-owned energy systems have made that happen and we've seen that in many, many different countries, in Germany, in Denmark, in other places. So yes, governments have to change and here in the UK, for example, we are engaged in, in campaign to ensure that we decarbonise our energy sector. We know the scale of change that's required. Yes, we need to see a, a to an average level of about 60% emissions reduction for the European Union by 2030. But all of those smart solutions exist and the finance for them does exist as well. So when we talk you know, of why there is a block, we only need to look at the these dirty energy companies that are sponsoring the COP, for example, Asomittal, who are, get a taxpayer handout of about 1.6 billion every year from the from the failed ETS uh, uh, emissions trading scheme credits. So these these companies have it in their interest to ensure that this progress is slow or is is not to the level that's required. In my mind, it's like the equivalent of asking a tobacco industry to sponsor a conference on lung cancer and, and then being surprised that it continues to encourage us to continue smoking. So, yes, we need to do that, but what's really required is to ensure that the voice of green business is heard, that the voices of those people who are being impacted are being heard, and we hope to do that at the Climate Talks in Warsaw.
Like, well, maybe it's those kind of divergent views which shows just why it's so difficult to tackle time, climate change. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your time. Bjorn Lomborg, Assad Rehman and Daniel Lassoff. And thank you very much for joining us on this edition of Inside Story. If you want to send us your feedback, please email your thoughts to us at InsideStory at aljazeera.net. I'm Jane Dutton. Thank you very much for watching. Bye-bye.